unfortunately, I had a, a, an accident and lost the tops of my fingers. And then I was obviously laid off work for a year. I spent a lot of time at home finding myself and learning how to DJ differently again. Be although, although theoretically I am right-handed, which was really good because I can still yeah, scratch. Yeah, still do your thing, yeah. yeah. But I couldn't, you know, be ambidextrous. It's like the Tony Iommi of fucking DJ mixing. It's the killer, killer, podcast KillerKellerOfficial.com You need the Kellervision app. 24-7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Beatbox created. Killer Keller. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Killer Podcast, live and direct, central London or central as you need to be, choose to be, want to be, on this fine morning. Big shout out to graffitikings.co.uk. Um, <clears throat> without a doubt, if you haven't checked out the Television app, free download, you are severely missing on your street culture doses every day. Free download, Android, Apple, um, out of the app stores. And uh, yeah, uh, where to begin with my fine guest, a very good friend of mine, somebody that pretty much introduced me into hip hop. <laughs> And I warned him before we started there was going to be some gushing going on here. Uh, he knows my nan. He knows my mum. He, uh, he, he's a proprietor of records. He's a club creator. He's an award winner. He's a breakbeat producer, collaborator across funk, breakbeat, hip-hop and more. DJ Crafty Cuts, how are we, my brother? Oh, mate, that, that, that was probably the introduction of all time. <laughs> and isn't that weird that kind of like touching on all those subjects, like all the people that we knew and all the... Mm. You know, that just brings back a lot of memories as you're talking like that. I kind of remember sitting in that tiny record shop in Worthing <laughs> and you're walking in and doing all those little funny noises that you used to do. <laughs> and I just kind of think to myself, oh, my God, that it seems like such a long time ago. Oh, mate, I tell you, boy. You look good, mate. You're looking well. Thank you. So are you. Thanks, mate. It's I've like a Peter bit of sun. fucking pan in here. <laughs> a bit of sun and doesn't help. <laughs> it does help, sorry. Yeah. And um, I've got a nice place down in Worthing, so... You know, um, I'm enjoying life at the moment, spending a lot of time with my children Beautiful. and getting creative with my music and stuff. So, as we know, and we'll probably talk about it, it's been a very strange 14, 15, 16 months. Yeah, it's been a very and crazy time. It, yeah, it's really it's like a roller coaster. It's just up and down constantly. A fucking crafty cuss in the mm. house. What you say? For those who don't know about the, the double K in terms of pioneering breakbeat, I mean, this was... I know I'm going to be speaking to the choir here. There's going to be a lot of people here that are very familiar with what you've done. But I, and I said it before I jumped on, bro, just out of curiosity, I thought, oh, I'll go on, I'll go on your bio. I'll just go on your bio. Because, you know, I know you a lot in a yeah. load of different scenarios for all of my best part of my musical life. But when I see how much stuff you've done, mm. uh, you've got a theory on this, haven't you? You know, people just don't have... Me included. We we don't have that attention to follow things through like we may have done with our more um, celebrated uh, favourite acts back in the day. It's just it's too much information nowadays, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's so easy. We, you know, we were just talking about that a moment ago. It's like, for example, you know, there might be an artist that you're aware of and you haven't really paid a great deal of attention to that person and then suddenly you like look at their bio or you listen to some of their music and you go oh my god they've done that record i, I didn't realize you know for example like bookham bookham's a great example danny's a fantastic dj really professional artist and if you go back to like some of his early recordings you'll go oh my god i had no idea he run that label and he did that True. and he made this and it's like everyone everyone's got a story everyone's got something you know, within the music industry that they might have, might have done, whether it's one or two records or a bundle of records mm. or a lot of different things. And they might have had their hands in different pies or fingers in different pies and done like production on some hip hop tracks or they worked or they were the DJ for for a rapper or like we were just talking mm. about a minute ago, DJ Renegade. Mm. And it just you just kind of think, oh, I didn't realise that. Oh, yeah, of course, it all makes sense. And they're, they're little things that join the dots that fix the jigsaw and make the puzzle. You yeah, know, some of it's like urban myth, isn't it? Like, like we, were talk we were talking about Renegade and Son of Noise and um, who else? Uh, DJ Supreme. We got into a bit of UK hip hop just before we started. And uh, these, these myths of like, oh yeah, he did that, didn't he? He did that. Yeah, did yeah. That? I love those stories, you know? The, 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 the deeper Joining you go. Joining the dots. Yeah. Roots Maneuver. Yeah. And Charlie Tuna, Joining the Dots. Hey, hey listen, and listen. 
There we go. We're beginning right there. Charlie Tuna, yourself. This was, for me, the last time I saw you guys perform was... Uh, I can't remember what fucking festival Camden? it was. Camden? No, Camden Assembly Hall? Something. Or? No, it was a festival. I'm sure it was a festival. Oh, right, OK. I'm just trying to think which one it would have been. Maybe... Um, oh, I've done so many with Charlie, but... Uh, but it, yeah. was, it was... For me, it was like... Seminal is like you, you had you, you managed it was a zeitgeist moment where an American act and a UK alternative DJ, yeah, comparable yeah. to what Charlie's exactly come yeah. from. Hey, it's just it was fucking great, it was oh, great, thanks, mate. And the mixes, you know, you'd, you, you go on YouTube and check them out, it, you know, and they, they got albums, you know, they, they've done their thing. It was, it was an amazing experience, and we're still really good friends. We speak a lot. It's been very difficult because the COVID thing just kind of shut it down, mm. and we were kind of doing some other stuff and preparing some other stuff. But we're still working together on a few new pieces, nice. which I'll go into in a minute. But um, I met Charlie through the Funk Hunters, a Canadian sort of uh, glitch hop, uh, breaky kind of producers. Uh, really nice guys, Nick and Dunks. And they were touring with Charlie. And I'd always wanted to work with like Jurassic 5 and Charlie too, you know, always, mm -hmm. especially as I'd been recently started writing hip hop with... Um, Alex Chambers, who I worked with in the studio. Mm -hmm. And uh, we'd wrote a track, um, I'm trying to think what it was called now, but this was Hands High, that became Hands High. And it's got a like, piano riff and it's got a really nice old school hip hop sort of feel. And I was desperate to get it to Jurassic 5 because I thought, God, if these guys performed on this, this, is, this has got winner, chicken dinner written all over <laughs> it. And I was like, um, and they were touring uh, Brighton. And I spoke to Nick Middleton from the Funk Hunters and I said, oh, um, can you send this to Charlie, see if he'd like it. I'll come and see you in Brighton tonight. Mm. So I went and saw them and I got to meet Charlie and I was well excited. I'd met him years before when they performed with Cut Chemist and DJ Shadow. I think you, you may have yeah, been yeah, there. of course. At the, at the Zap Club, I think Zap it was. Club. Dude, they, th 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 again, combinations and just putting music out just the way that they felt it. Like, the, yeah, get, anyway, carry, sorry. Carry That's on. all right. Carry no, on. no, you're totally right. And Inspir um, Inspiring shit. I, I, yeah, definitely. I was always in in love with the whole sort of party, funky, part, you know, just really nice hip hop vibe, mm. and I, that's why I felt this track fitted like Charlie's and the rest of the guys' voices. Mm. And Charlie loved it. And Nick said, "Why don't we? You know, if I'm in the studio the next day. So I think this was a Wednesday night. So Thursday night I was in the studio in in Mepham in Kent, and Nick came down with Charlie." And got him, and luck. You know, if it wasn't for Nick, I, this would never have happened. Charlie loved the track, mm -hmm. and and I was like, oh my god, I can't believe I've got Charlie Tuna in yes, the studio. Yes, yeah. Bang, and the magic happened. He wrote like the track hands high in like three hours, yeah. and he used some of the vocals from going outside, and he saw a bar now, and he used that in the lyrics, and just other little things, and he absolutely nailed it. And it was the beginning of something really special. And we just, I don't know, we just connected really well. He just loved the vibe that me and Alex were, produ um, you know, creating in the studio. Mm. And it was just a wonderful environment. He loved the sound. It was different. It kind of had a slightly electronic, sort of different style drums, but it was still funky. Mm. It had that backbone of funk and just, it was organic. It was, it was really real. And Charlie really liked that. And I wasn't like your traditional turntablist DJ, you know, you CDJs, but I could scratch and it I could cut. He does cut, he cuts hard. <laughs> and, but Charlie just liked the idea. It wasn't about that I was a real hip hop DJ. It was like, this is something fresh. This is something new. This is something exciting. This is something different. You know, and we all need to go on little paths, little curveballs and takers. But my God, we could not believe ourselves the reaction. Next minute, you know, we're starting to write an album. We've done a collaboration yeah. with Dynamite called It Ain't My Fault. Hold tight, Dynamite. Big up, Dynamite. Dynamite all day. Love you, bro. One of my favourite, favourite hype men MCs, MCs, full stop, to be fair. He's amazing, isn't yeah. he? Yeah. And, and we've done this track called It Ain't My Fault. And next minute, you know, it's just blowing up. And we started writing an album called The Adventures of Reluctant Superhero. Yeah, mad. And we got the uh, Jake, the detonator, to do all the artwork with the characters. And always we... killed it on the album covers as well. You always got that, it's that funk. It's mine's with Parliament, you know what I mean? Like, it, it, you always had that kind of cartoon, comic -y Yeah, you had that with Trick of Technology with A Skill. So it was a good sort of combination to carry on that sort of um, vibe. So I think, you know, just talking about this and everything involved within like yeah. graffiti and and artwork and stuff like that i think it all combines perfectly and that's the beauty of hip-hop is when you have 
a good product, which I think The Adventures was, mm. and then suddenly you had good artwork mm. and good PR and a good topic, mm. it all combines. It's like when you, just for example, it's like when you write a disco house record. If you've got that, that perfect singer on there that just looks good and works, and then you put a little video to, to, with it, bang, it's like the magic is created. It was just, it's exactly the same with hip hop. You get good artwork, you get like a good vibe and a good creation, and once the whole package is put together, People, I really like this. Mm. And then obviously they see it first and then they hear it. Plus Radio 6 got behind it and big up to Lauren Laverne for, for helping us with that and Steve Lamack and all the BBC One Six of the last people. standing proper radio station. Big up Capital Extra as well, but I would certainly say Six Music for the alternative. Yes, yeah. Kills it. They, and they had us do the, the live um, uh, show up in Liverpool, which was a great experience. And then suddenly me and Charlie were just touring the world and we were both, it, it both happened quite unexpectedly mm. for us. And Charlie was a busy guy, so trying to fit that in his schedule was, um, you know, was a mission. And also with me, I was like extremely busy with like all my other DJ shows. Mm. So I had to speak to my manager and make a decision. And then next minute, you know, we're touring Australia and Canada and, no, we didn't actually tour Canada, America. Um, New Zealand and Europe, like Europe was crazy busy. Mm. And we must have done about 250 shows in like three years. <coughs> but it did get the, to the bet, uh, it did hit us hard because, you know, we got sick on tour a few times and it knocked us sideways. All right, we're going to come way. back to this. Uh, this is a very interesting, but I need to ask you a question. Um, you, as a producer, because, you know, there's going to be a lot of people out there thinking, well, that's just like, that's like textbook how it's meant to roll. But, as a producer, you, you have to kind of, and this is only my perception from previous conversations, and I'm sure you'll relate to one once I was using, but add value if you can. You've got to construct a format. And you've got to create, create a project. And it, it's not as easy as just like, oh, yeah, that voice will work with that. It's mm. the, you've, you, you guys kind of, you producers, you shape a sound, and then before you know it, the product is coming to, to life and there's an umbrella of a, a, a feel and a look and a... And that must be quite a, a turbulent time coming from something, nothing to making something. It is really. That's a really good point, Lee. It's like, it's like any 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 form of music. Let's let's take for example like Skrillex. Now Skrillex is an, an incredibly talented human being, mm. and he can write music. You know whether it's pop or, or dubstep or whatever he's writing, but it's the team. So all the videos, all the PR, all the promotion. They're as good at what they do as what he is as good as what he does. So when when you start putting all these groups together, same with Tiesto and mm. same with all the big DJs, producers. DJ Snake and all that, yeah, you know, big yeah. ones of the... Yeah, the exactly, thing. that's a great example. The product is just like the artwork's really good, the videos are really good. His music is, you know, according to his fans... Brilliant. And the same with Noisier. It's, it's all the detail and attention to detail is really incredible. And when you deliver this product to the people, if it's got all this weight behind it, it's like, wow, this is really good mm. if you're into that, you know. Mm. And then with hip hop, it's the same with hip hop. You know, the artwork's really dope and the music is really good. And that's that's what we try to achieve, like working with Lyrics Born, Gift of Gab and Dynamite and Sky from More Chiba. Mm. You know, these are people... Tip top and sky, what a voice! Yeah. Unbelievable, Great, and yeah. these are these are really good artists and really nice people, mm. really professional people. And you know, you ask them to do something, and they don't dilly dally, or they don't like, oh, 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 you know, they they just get on it, and they're so professional. And you're like, this is exactly what you need to help you move and go forward, and have a, and have a team around you that kind of. So, curiously, if you had, if you take for instance a. a a Diplo or or yeah, Tiesto or one. someone like that. So they have a team around them, and their their team hedges bets on this project, yeah, yeah. whether it's a single or an album, goes to the market, and they can the market reacts, and all of the lights come on as green, mm. and and bells and whistles, it's off to the races. There's still that inception, and you've still got to as a producer, as a as a brand, you've got to encourage that team. You've got to, you've got to excite that team. That, again, I'm just putting it back to you. That's that's where you come in, and that must be such a that must be such a a process in your head to try and compartmentalize. Oh, that, yeah, that that's that's probably the the part that I do the most because um, I like to think of the big picture and where we can go, what we can do, how we can gel this with that. So it's kind of like you know, 
making that all come together as a project. And that's what I think I was really good at. Hence, having experience within the record shop, knowing people's knowledge of music. Mm. You know, when you was in my shop, someone would walk past, I'd play a jungle record, Congo Natty really loud, mm. or a funk sample mm. that everyone knew. Because it wasn't just hip-hop, it was everything. No, it, it was, everything. Yeah, it was Drum everything. Drum and bass, everything, yeah. Yeah. And people would hear it and go, oh, what's that? I like that, especially in Brighton, where it was like you had loads more people. Oh, this is Worthing as well. Well, yeah. Worthing, the, across the tracks was the... Yeah, store, Instant Vibes was what it was first called Instant after Across the Tracks. Wow, geez. And we had that Dan who worked for DC Comics do the graffiti on That's the That's right. And Mex used to work there, Big Up Mex as yeah, well. Yeah, Big Up Mex. I spoke to him the other day, actually. He's oh, tell him I said, I don't see yeah, him for ages. Yeah, guy. Black Grass, Big Up Black Grass. They wrote great music, him and Carl, for. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's about... Joining the dots, like that's mm. that's the talk, the the talk of the um, that's the subject. Mm. Joining the dots is so important because if you can get all these things together, then once you deliver that product, you know people are like, well, this is this is perfect, mm -hmm. and that is the hardest thing. But I've got you know I've got a good team. My manager's a really great guy, and I've got really able, good right? Yes, that's Hold right. Able, big up able, and these are all really nice people to work with, and I like to work with good people. I don't really like to work with people who might be fantastic at what they do, but they piss other people off because they can be rude mm. or they can be forgetful. I always, feel like, I always feel like a manager, when people say, <laughs> okay, right, so this could get spicy. I'm not going down this road, but sometimes, you know, when you have to speak to the manager uh, or, the, or the artist says, speak to my manager and you get a certain temperature from that manager, you know that the manager is only an extension to the artist. So what they represent as a manager is ultimately the attitude of the artist. You know, that's a really good point. It's true, isn't it? That's a really good point. Yeah, you know, we're not saying that everyone who's got a manager and if their managers can be a bit of a piece of work, that they're a piece of work. Yeah. But that is a good point. You, you know, I consider myself as a decent person. Really, and Come on, yes. Thanks, man. I, I, I do. And, you know, I've got a lot of love to give and I've got a lot of nice... Um, just, I'm just a, a decent person, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think my manager's exactly the same. And you're yeah, right. Yeah, That's yeah. a really good point. You know, I haven't got a bad word to say about anyone. It's not my opinion to diss someone, even if I don't like it. Mm -hmm. You know, I respect that person for what they do in any form of music. And that comes from having a record shop selling funk, disco, hip hop, rave, happy hardcore, techno, pop, true. rock. Right. But, you know, but everything. So, so look, all right. Just to give you guys a bit of a background, the background scoop on how we first met. So I was I was a young, thirsty. I think I must have been about twelve years old, man. Thirteen, oh, bro. Really? Bro, yeah. This is showing both of our ages. I will not disclose any further the information. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't from Worthing. Worthing, for those outside of the UK, is is, is like a, a, a town just in the south coast, next to um, Brighton and Hove on the on the south coast, and um, that's where Martin's shop the original shop, Instant Vibes, which was then Cross Tracks. And uh, my nan lived just down the road. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Big up my nan, she's still alive, she's doing oh, well. Bless. And, uh, <laughs> and I remember one time, right, this was my seminal moment into hip-hop. <laughs> I'd always come around and got 12-inch records. I was waiting for Onyx, but... Um, Back the fuck up. Yeah, yeah. Now, the way it's spelt on the record is one word, back the yeah, fuck up, right? Yeah, yeah. So I said to my nan, I was like, nan, can you go into the record store um, and ask Martin if if he has a copy of back the fuck up? As in like, mm. it's like a it, it's like a buttercup, it, it's, but it's called back the fuck up. <laughs> and my nan went for it. She was like, okay, so I can only imagine my nan of like 77 walking I can, in. I can actually remember it <laughs> yeah. because it was it was such a surprise that, and you know, yeah. a nan would come in and ask for that record. I actually met Onyx on a plane. Did They're you? They're really nice guys. One of my heroes then. Yeah, that was a great track. Mm. They've done some really good tunes on it. Mm. Um, Slam, obviously, as we know. Yeah. But yeah, I met them on the plane. And that's another thing with Charlie. I met a lot of uh, dudes and hip hop acts that I've, you know, looked up to and had massive respect for. And but, they just yeah, chatted away with but me. That's, but, that's, but, but you have to be um, aware of the scene. And that's the thing. When you have a record store, or when you have a, a club night, when you're a promoter especially, or you've got a radio station, anything like that, you, even if you, whether you like an act or you don't, you become so in tune to understanding the nuances of a, of a sound or the personality of, a, of an act. You, it must have been mad. You just like, as you come out of the record store era and getting into more DJ territory, you, I mean, I remember when we did a gig together at Miami and it was just like, it was just like, an, it was like a weird moment of, Wow, it's, it's really happened, yeah, Martin. From you, back there yeah. to this now. It's incredible, mm, really, when mm, you think about it. Mm. 
but it's like a natural progression. Most DJs or producers or etc. might have worked in a record shop or gone to a record shop to buy records. Mm. And having my, you know, basis of, of selling music to people really helped me as a DJ because I would analyse, and this was my thing, I'd analyse when people walked past, looking at what they were wearing and and think, right, I reckon they might be into this. Mm. So I might play like a, a disco record or, or a funk record and stuff like that. So always playing things that people could familiarise with or think, oh, I, I, what is that? Oh, that's, that's good. That's good and branding, man. And then it ties man. people in. Yeah. And, and because obviously I had to make some money from the record shop and I was doing really well at one point and I was going all across the world and finding really cool records. I was buying like really rare hip hop records, really rare funk records. And, and, and so I was selling new and old records together. And basically, I was also learning about like Jimi Hendrix, Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin and other stuff like that. So going to car boot sales and, and record stores, uh, record uh, uh, fairs and buying records <clears throat> to sell in my record shop. So my knowledge of music became vast. And that is how that, that really helped me, helped me become a better DJ mm. because my knowledge of music was stronger mm. and bigger. And it helped me just become you know, more aware mm. that there was like, you know, if I played a Prodigy record at the end of my set, but played the original Jar Screechy or um, Walk and Skank from SL2 or something like that. It's just that. like a nod to the to the old school that yeah, you, people like, you know oh, what you're talking you about. Yeah, yeah. And I'll tell you another story later on. I'll, I'll, actually, I'll tell you it now. There was a club called Home in Leicester Square. Re really, it was kind of, kind of uh, trying to, go against Fabric at the time, and it was massive. And they had the biggest names in there. And this was before I played at Fabric. And I went there and I played um, a three-hour set on three decks, and vinyl, and I think I might have had a fourth CDJ. It might have even been the four CDJs. Absolutely Jeez. tore it up. Played one of the best sets I've ever played. And I thought, I smashed it. I think I smashed it. And, the, and, I, and I had the crowd going nuts. I thought, this is going to do really well for my DJ career. Because this was at the early stages of my DJ and career. And all the attention was on this home place because it was the... Yeah. I thought, I was, yeah. right, yes. This guy, this Brazilian guy, I never knew who he was. He came on. His first record was Jar Screechy, Walk and Skank. This was kind of like early days, even before going on the internet and Google and searching. So you had to find out what that record was. Mm. You had to know mm. what that record was. And, and that own was his it. first record, yeah. yeah. He dropped Jar Screechy, Walk and Skank. And I was like, and, and the crowd just went bananas. They went nuts. And I was like, they'd just forgotten about everything that I'd just done in, in three hours of music. That one record that that dude had just played just blew my whole set away. And I was like, there's an important uh, lesson that I've just learned. Never overestimate how good you think you are or what you've done. There's always someone else out there who can either change things or do something better with just one quick moment. Ooh. And I was like, you know what? I need to improve. And that helped me. And then I started changing things around. I started mixing my music up more. I started playing music from other genres. Mm. And I, 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 I started playing hip-hop, breakbeat, funk, um, you know, old school and, and, and jungle mm. and stuff like that. And I'd, I, I, it came at a time where Britain was really into that, you know, mm -hmm. like the big beat movement and everything else. Yeah, that's right. So people would go to a club and they'd hear all those sounds of music in one night, hence how we set up Supercharged and Supercharged became so popular in Brighton <laughs> because we had all that. <laughs> we had funk, disco, breaks, it's kind of the home of and it. It was the bass. home of it, you know. And that think. helped me. And that one little lesson that I learned, I think really helped Crafty Cuts become a, a better DJ yeah. and um, just never really th and, and stop thinking that, you know, you're the shit because yeah. there's always someone else out there who's way better than you are. Yeah, yeah. Time is a constant. There's always someone new, something next, something else, isn't there? Exactly. Um, how did, now, there's an, there is a myth. And it's regarding your hand, actually, because you uh, you cut your fingers, didn't you? And yeah. Is that is so? Explain the story behind that, and was that did that did did that help facilitate or allow you to focus more on your record collecting and the DJing? Yeah, yeah, okay. that's yeah. an interesting the story. story. Yeah. So, um, I was just getting into like hip hop and DJing, and I was learning to like uh, scratch on my. I just got some turntables, some Technics turntables, and a decent mixer, and I was practicing, albeit to the. I used to piss my ex-wife off big time of cutting up Anna Fish to Soul, 
it's time, it's time, it's time, and good times, good time. <laughs> Just repeating, that's all she could hear in the next yeah, yeah, room yeah. and so drive you, her mad. She's X. She's X. <laughs> yeah, exactly, X. Bless, bless her. Um, we, I've got two wonderful children um, mm. with her. We, we've got uh, twins, Future Flex, who's my son, who's now a DJ. Get out of here. Yeah, isn't that what? mad? He's really See? good. He's just signed some tracks to Declines later. When love becomes awesome. See what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying. See, the future is here. He's got, you know what I mean? He's backed up. You've got you know, like, a <laughs> conveyor belt of crafty cuts. <laughs> the new crafty yeah, cuts. Yeah, the conveyor belt. So basically, <laughs> I was a wood machinist. And I used to make fireplaces, yeah. believe it or not. And obviously, that was my form of income. And one day, I said to my ex-wife, I said, oh, I don't feel very well. I don't feel great today. And I was working a lot of hours. I was doing like 78 hours a week then because I had a big mortgage. It was And there was a bit of a recession going on. So I, I had to make ends meet. So I went in not feeling that great into work. This is when I was living in Bognor Regis. And um, unfortunately, I had a, a, an accident and lost the tops of my fingers. And then I was obviously laid off work for a year. And then I had to wait because I was, I was an unskilled machinist. So it was actually their fault. So I got compensation. I had to wait two years. <laughs> and during that time, I spent a lot of time at home, finding myself and learning how to DJ differently again. Because, although, although theoretically, I am right-handed, which was really good because I can still yeah, scratch. Yeah, still do thing, yeah. yeah. But I couldn't, you know, be ambidextrous. It's like the Tony Iommi of fucking DJ mixing. <laughs> so, you know what I mean? It's like you've got your skill and this cut, the cuts probably yeah. won't be the same as anybody else's because of these, yeah. you know, quote-unquote handicaps. You yeah. know what I mean? It's, it was a, an extreme... Um, devastation. I thought I, I, I'm. You thought it was lucky. over. You yeah, th I thought it was over. And I, I had a lot of really good DJs around me that you know um, I, I wished that I could continue my progression and it's getting better. But obviously, I fell behind. And then eventually, when I taught myself, I then started. I got the money from the compensation. I bought a ton of records at car boot sale. Most amazing records, by the way. Mm. And that kind of opened up the door. And then I had all these records in my house. Uh, really peed off my ex-wife again. <laughs> a whole room of just, you know, thousands and thousands of records. And then a record store came along. I put all these rec bought the record store, put all these records into the record. Hence, Instant Vibes was born. And then I got another shop in Brighton, HVR. Yeah. And then suddenly I met a lot of different people in Brighton and I was writing music and getting in the studio in between the little time that I had and playing football as well. I remember Saturdays would play football and during the week I'd be um, writing yeah, you're music. well into your football, weren't you? Yeah, I love football. Oh, you know, football. And um, yeah, I, I kind of like used the compensation money to set up a record shop, which then opened the door to me meeting like Norman Cook. And he walked into my shop one day and I cut an acetate of, of a track called Give Me The Funk. And I played it to Norman. I said, oh, Norman, you know, I was quite nervous. Oh, you think you might like this? And it was a sample of the breaks, Curtis Blow, loads of samples. And he goes, man, I absolutely love that. That's really good. And on the other side was my crafty intro. And I was like, what do I do? Do I give him this acetate that just cost me 50 quid that I just made like a couple of weeks ago? Mm. Or do I keep it? And I thought, no, no, give it to Norman. Give it to him. Go. And said, look, you have this. And he was like, Really? And he played it on the radio. Because you gave it to him, you know, that's a huge, you know, a huge head nod. There Lucky isn't it, he didn't you? play the jingle on the other side. He's <laughs> like, oh, my God, I played the wrong track. Anyway, he played Give Me The Breaks, Give Me The Funk, sorry. So, um, Ministry of Sound got hold of me and said, have you got any more music? Like, this was then the beginning of, like, when Big Beat was huge. And, yep, I went back and with uh, the engineer that I was using, Chris Sargent at the time, we wrote like an EP and they and this is a really cool story in a minute to go alongside this. And we sampled a track from Get Carter but with Michael Caine. <laughs> the bass line is doom doom do do doom doom do do doom doom do 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 who is it is it is it and we used an old school hip hop vocal. Yeah. They used this record. Um the, I think I signed this to this movie, Mean Machine, with uh, Guy Ritchie movie, uh before we signed to Ministry of Sound. And they, they used it, and my ex-manager at the time licensed it, and everything was really good. And I went to the premiere, and it was a Guy Ritchie movie, so Madonna was there, uh, Jason Statham was there, Kelly Brook was there, um, uh, Claudia Schiffer was there, and I met all these people, and I sat there with my ex-wife in Leicester Square, so the premiere, and as the opening track came on, it was my track. And if it wasn't for ministry asking me to write more music, I probably wouldn't have wrote that record. So it's amazing. And then next minute, you know, Crafty Cuts was born. I was just like getting offers for China, Australia, tours, and then I signed to Finger Licking Records. Mm. And then everything, the whole breakbeat movement was open. I started winning awards, and, and I was just like, 
my God, I was just living the dream. Oh. Absolutely living the dream. I mean, the, the word serendipity comes into play quite, a, quite often in the podcast. But when you take something so severe, like losing your fingers, and throw it back as a positive, and just going with the flow... <sighs> Nail, you nail Yeah, I like it. to try and take a negative and make it into a positive. And I believe that, people, if you've got anything bad that's happened in your life or anything sad or, or and things that are making you feel down and you've got negative thoughts in your mind, just focus. Even something simple like this. Even if you like thinking, I really need a holiday, actually plan your holiday in your head and think, oh, my God, it wouldn't be nice if we could go to, to Florida or, or California mm -hmm. or, or Spain and just have a break. And then start picturing yourself on a beach or drinking a, a nice beer in the hot weather or camping with the kids or whatever it might be and turn your negative thoughts into something positive and it just brings a little bit of a lift in your life mm. and it just gives you something to focus on and like or even like jot jotting things down in your diary or just mm. like focusing on some good memories or things that you remember yeah. and you think, you know what, I want to do that again. I want to picture myself being... Yeah. Doing, and that's what I'm always doing, always thinking about, you know, what I could create, just like what you do with the podcast. You've had mm. so many great people on here and I know, you know, after you finish this, you'll be thinking, oh, I wonder who I could get next or... Oh, under who's available, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. Yeah. and you've always got to be thinking positively yeah. and thoughtfully, and these thoughts can lead on to really lifting your energy yeah, yeah, and your yeah, vibe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm always thinking like that. I'm thinking about two or three things. Sometimes can make my head a bit cloudy and a bit foggy, but like you know, I'm right. That's what you got managers for? Big up Abel again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like that's what I'm always doing. Like like at the moment, I've got two projects which we talk about in a bit mm. that I'm focusing on, along with some other ideas as well. And it keeps me buzzing. It keeps me alive. It keeps me happy. You know, it ties me out for sure. Mm. But it's it's exciting. I, I enjoy it. Um, I, I have these ideas, and ones that um, to a lot of people are like time consuming, stressful. What well, I've got to get up and do that kind of shit, mm. kind of thing. But it's these things that wake get us up in the morning, isn't it? As a, yeah. as as not just creative people, because everyone's creative in one form or another. It's it's a tenacity. It's a it's a it's a. You come from a working place, you know. I think, but bear in mind, we come from a very similar area of the yep. of the country. There is a working class mentality in these areas, and mm. and I work that I I can't think of anything worse than just. Sitting down doing nothing. No. Do you know what I mean? You must be the same. It's that feeling of it doesn't matter how Motivation, many. Motivation. Yeah. Hard, it isn't doesn't matter it? how many projects are going. It's like I, it, even if it takes three months for something to come to fruition. Like us, even doing a podcast now, it took time. You know. Yeah, we talked about this a long time ago. You just got. You just got to have something to get up in the morning for, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, it is really difficult. This last year has been horrendous. I mean, you know, I've lost my dad. I lost my stepdad. Rest in peace. Well, wow. wow. thanks, man. And I, I've I've not been on a plane uh, for like four, 15 months, 14 months now. And I used to be on a plane every week. Not that going on a plane makes a difference, but it's routine. It's like someone who goes running. They go running once, twice, three times a week, maybe four times a week, mm. or every day. Mm. And it's, it's something that they do, and it's something that they look forward to and enjoy, or practising football, or whatever your chosen subject, or whatever you do. I would be, like, on a Friday, heading to an airport, even if it's just going to Edinburgh or Spain or wherever, and I'd be preparing, packing my bag, getting all my things organised. And um, that would be... My, my, mm. my job and I'd look forward to it and it'd be a new challenge something new meeting new people new faces you know destinations unknown and it would be mm. great and now I haven't done that in over a year and it just seems like massive things missing on and then spending a lot of time at home negative thoughts just like feeling very lethargic very mm. tired very like you know don't get me wrong I've spent some wonderful times with my family and my, and my children mm. especially but you know with like career wise the only thing that's kept me going is doing my streams, which have been fantastic, mm. and um, writing music. Mm, yeah. Those two things in, in, in my in my job wise have kept me, you know, on the straight and narrow. Yeah, you mentioned you know finding things in your life, things positive things like a, a trip away or, or or having had a trip away, and referring back to that feeling that you had and one you know thinking forward and doing something like that again that's that's definitely from an artist's point of view where we we definitely you know got trumps because 
we we did that. We do that. We go away, and we. I, I mean, we've crossed paths in Canada, Miami. You know, like everywhere. We've been. You know what I mean? And and always a surprise. Always always fucking good times hanging out. That's kind of a holiday, though, isn't it? It is. It a is. Kind it's of it's a like holiday. a busman's holiday. It's the old saying, <laughs> isn't it? Work. I mean, my job was. It's like. It's like being a Formula One racing driver or a footballer. It's like one of the best jobs you can get being a DJ and a producer. You know, and I'm very blessed and very lucky. And I I, I thank all my fans and everyone who supports me. Because you've you know, got some hardcore upwards. fans, bro. <laughs> I'm very lucky. I've got some wonderful people. And, mm. you know, I still want to keep giving back to them. I'm just about to set up a Patreon. I've just taken a short break from doing my streams at the moment because I've been doing streams. I think I've done 56 weeks of streaming tell them how many because you've had so much heat off of them you've been busy yeah busy, busy. when i first started doing the streams uh at the end of march when we first went into lockdown my son said dad we need to get on and do some live streams and at the time i was like oh i don't know i'm not really into streaming live you know i like to play in the clubs we'll be back in the club soon don't worry this will all blow over he said dad we need to do it and i was like all right i trusted his judgment and he helped set it all up. We just put a phone in front of the deck. What's your, what's your son's DJ name again? Future Flex. Future Flex. Big up, Bill. Old type, Future Flex. And it was unbelievable. We like we were the first people virtually um, in lockdown, you know, as in the DJs who were going to try something different. So, I mean, I know people who were doing streaming anyway. And we put the camera in front of us. And after like three weeks, the momentum was building huge on my Facebook. It was just on my Facebook at the time. And we had on one, I think it was on the third week... 147,000 views the following day on Facebook. What? I was like, are you kidding me? And, and I was like, oh, my God. But then people started to complain and say, look, you've got to get the sound dry. Because I was just like putting the phone in front of it so you could just hear it from the phone. Then we plugged the phone into the mixer. And then the phone, an iPhone, is like a mic when you plug it in. So it kept cutting out like that. Uh. And people then was like, oh, you need to do something better. So then we discovered OBS and we started mm. doing proper streaming and then Twitch. And next thing you know, it's just... You know, we were doing so much. And then because Bill was making house music at the time and he'd gone to do all that sort of stuff, I didn't know if it was right for him to, because I was playing predominantly hip-hop and breaks. And he was playing house music? And he was playing house music, yeah. And I thought maybe not right for him to to bring that sort of music into my crowd of people. But then I thought, you know what? I've got to give him the opportunity to do his thing. And because he was so good on the mic, mm -hmm. he was really good on the mic. And then while I'm busy, like mixing and so playing sick. records to people, he'd be giving people shouts. And, the, you know, he's a good looking lad and all the girls loved him. And then people, you know, they really enjoyed what he was doing. And then I thought, let, let him do his thing. And then he started doing his own streams on the balcony where I live. And then he was doing some little guest spots on mine. And then slowly but surely, it became a father-son stream. And every week for the, like, say, from like 20 weeks onwards, like 30-odd streams, we just done them together. And he was just like so good. And he helped me. And, I'm, you know, I can't praise him anymore. And then he started writing breakbeat records. And next thing you know, he's playing these records. And I'm playing my own son's records in my stream. And they're like one of the biggest tracks in my stream. And the reaction on Twitch I can't is deal mental. with this. It's so fucking mental. And my son, I'm playing back to back sets with my son, and it's leading on us to getting some socially distanced shows at the time. And people are knowing Bill without actually meeting him through the streams. This yeah. is the weirdest thing. And there were so many people that I was chatting on the streams with that I'd never met in, in, in the flesh from all over the world, from Portugal to Brazil to. Chile to 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 everywhere, a lot of places that Argentina that I'd never been to, and I was like, oh, it's so frustrating. I just want to meet these people, want to go and play to them. And Bill was the same, and there was this this like unity with everyone, just loving us for giving them so much love from our music, and it just formed this bond. And the streams are just getting. Talk such... to me about this bond. Talk to me about this bond between you and your son. That that, that arguably actually probably one of the, the highlights of stories that I've actually just heard through the whole year is about you and your son just kind of combining forces. Let's get into a little bit of this, the dynamics here, because he's your boy. You, you brought him up, you raised him. Now all of a sudden you're in the same, you're on the, you're on the same um, creative paddock. You, you're working together in the, in the, in the same environment. Uh, this must be like a, Four wheel drive in your relationship. It must. I mean, obviously, it comes with its own. You know, you know the, the, the business and pleasure thing and the family and you know. I know that that all comes into play. It's not all these roses, but there must be like this real. Wow, we are really doing it. That's crazy. It is. It is 
um, surreal. Sometimes, you know, I take a step back because we've got a green screen set up like over the last couple of months and it looks really good. And my son's on there and he's got his own little visuals and I just take a step back, look at the comments that are coming through on Twitch. And then he plays his record and his new record at the moment has got such a good vocal in. And I sing it and I just really like it. It's called Desire. It's actually coming out on my own label as well, <laughs> Instant Vibes, which is a bit of a thrill. And I just think to myself, wow, I'm so proud of my son, what he's achieved. Mm. And I didn't think it would go this way. I didn't want to be one of these pushy dads because I'm not like that. You know, when you go to football, mm. your dad's shouting on the touchline, screaming. And I've seen other dads do it. Yeah. And I just thought, that's not a good it's not a good look. way to it's not a look because they end up like resenting you because you push them in the, in a way that they didn't want to go. Yeah. yeah, and I did that with my son <clears> Billy, <throat> and I'm doing it with my son Tommy Joe, who's 11, and he's a brilliant footballer. And I do see that he might have the opportunity to be maybe a pro, but the way it's nurturing and the way it's going is the same way I've done with my son. And when I got my decks at my last house in Shoreham, I, I left them there for my son to practice and I said, look, and these are expensive CDJs and a really nice mixer. Mm. I said, just go and teach and do what you want and I taught him how to do other things on there. But I wasn't a pushy dad. I, I wasn't, look, son, you've got to do it this way. This mm. is the only way. Listen to me. You know, I was never like that. I was mm. just like, I left my USB sticks in. But he he went to college in Worthing and, and, and got taught by a lot of the teachers there how to write music and then I kind of helped him with his DJing. But then he kind of taught himself, really, because he was, you know, he watched me come to a lot of shows with me, see what I was doing. And his style of DJing is slowly becoming a little bit like mine in the sense of he's, he, he's mixing is really quick and really easy and he, he's really relaxed mm -hmm. with it. And that's something that, you know, you guys, when you practice, and that is, it's true, the practice makes perfect. Now, I'm not saying I'm a brilliant DJ or anything like that, but I can mix records quite easily now yeah. because of the amount of practice I've had yeah. and doing the streams as well each week, constantly mixing different genres and styles of records like while even I'm this, talking. Even, this year, even if yeah, I'm exactly the same as you, bro, like it's true practice makes perfect, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. And and Bill's done that where he's been doing the streams and he's constantly practicing all the time. His mixing's got really good and he can mix records that are maybe not even in key, which is something years ago, I'd go, oh, they've got to be in the right key, they've got to match. Mm. You know, you can mix records that are not in the right key and still make them sound really good. you just got to be clever. Mm. And it's choosing the right time to bring them out, bring them in. And that's what I've noticed Bill's starting to get really good at that. And that is something that you can't teach. It's like something that you you just acquire yeah. through, through listening and watching and thinking, you know what, I'm going to try this. And, and just being clever, just being really Pe clever. People think, people think that mixing and kick, like you, like you were saying, there's, there's other ways of, you know, working a tune in, and mixing and blending. I mean, you know, there's there's the, the Rodigans of the world that are just bona fide selectors. Yeah. And there's just an energy that falls mm. into each That's a good mix. Call. Mm. You know, but but then when you add the mixing into it, you can't always be in key. You could just got to go with the energy. Yeah, that's it's really, really hard good to do, point. isn't it? It's really hard to do. And that's what I'd say to every budding DJ out there. And it doesn't matter what form of music you're into. Go and see Fatboy Slim. Go and see Andy C. Mm. Go and see Friction. Mm. Go and watch DJ Lord from from Prophets of Rage and Public Enemy. Yeah. Go and watch these DJ and Craze and A Track mm. and uh, Scratch Bastard. That's probably and Jazzy Jeff. Mm. They're two Scratch of Bastard. the most incredible DJ. Especially Scratch Bastard, mm. phenomenal, mm. like multitasking. His knowledge of music mm. is exceptional. Dangerous, dangerous. He levels. is. He's, he's he's deadly, and and you can learn so much because you can see how comfortable he is with what he's doing, and that portrays in how easy it is for him to do what. But he's doing. I, I would also like to interject because the breakbeat scene, and I'm going to throw out some extra pioneers: A Skills, um, yeah. Decline, yeah. Stanton Warriors, Hold Tight, Don B, yeah. yourself, you guys. Um, one thing I really admire about you guys is your um, enforced uh, music policy. Probably more so Stanton Warriors, I guess. But I really admire DJs and producers um, that s hold their lane. You know what I mean? Some things go out of season and out of flavour. Some things stay in flavour all the time. But with Breakbeat, I've always felt like you guys, rain or shine, you hold true to your audience, you know? So just to add value to what you're saying, you have to go and see a Crafty Cuts show. You've got to go and see, because again, these are, these are, these are, 
um, these are uh, anchors in 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 our street culture scene, and I do I do feel that like oh, thanks, there's a lot of there's a lot of value in going to going to a breakbeat show. Full stop. That's a good way of putting it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? when you come to like a a, a night, say Plump DJ, Stanton Warriors, there you go. Yeah. Decline, yeah. and A Skills, you're going to get a really nice cross section and genres. You're going to get maybe a little bit of house mix, flavors mixed in with the breaks, and a little bit of maybe drum and bass sort of sound. Mm. So you're going to get all these little flavors. It's like when you go for a curry, mm. you know, you, you know, you know that that curry has been made with yeah, love. Yeah, he said cut is so true. It's and you're so like, true. oh my god, this tastes so good, and you're like really enjoying, and then you you taste another bit of someone else's or whatever, and you're like, oh my god, that's good. When you come to one of these nights, that's what you're going to get. You're yeah. going to get good music with good good quality DJs, yeah. and it's really enjoyable. There's no attitude, and you know the girls are dancing, the guys are dancing, everyone's happy, and that's what breakbeats always been about yeah. you know the flavors the style the sound and for me that's what crafty cuts is about it's like i'm not saying i'm really good at what i do but it's like a chef he, he's cooking mm. a spaghetti bolognese when you watch like goodfellas and all those films and he's like i uh, think who, who was it who's mixing that spaghetti bolognese and he tells the boy don't keep stirring keep stirring and the police are swarming outside and they're watching them and he said just keep stirring that bolognese keep stirring that sauce and keep adding a bit of salt, a bit of this and a bit of that. A good DJ is like, you know, a good chef. Cooks up a good bit of flavour uh, yeah. and then dishes it out and everyone's like, oh, that's great. You know, that's a, and that is it. When you taste good food, it's like music. When you hear good music, you're like, oh, my God. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it, it generates emotions and, and power in, in your moods and stuff. And just like you feel so good. Like if you go for a weekend, and this is why I miss DJing so much, and you see the crowd and, mm. and they love it and you get comments back on your Twitter or your socials or whatever. And say, oh, I really enjoyed your set. It was amazing, like with Charlie or whatever. He's so good. And it just makes you feel brilliant. Yeah. And it's the same as a chef. When he puts your food on your plate and he sees the enjoyment that you have eating it, it's the same feeling. And, um, and that is what is so important because mm. with a DJ or a musician is when you see and hear the reactions that people get to your music or your performance... It's like nothing else in the world that can beat it, whether you're playing to 50 people or 20,000 people. I think that's where people get... First of all, actually, let me just hail up Wizard as well, as, as, a, as, a, as a mastering producer, fucking wizard. Um, also, Farbsy Funk uh, in uh, Toronto, who, you know, I think he's booked us a couple of times as well, hasn't yeah, he? he? Did, yeah, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. Make it funky, hold tight. Um, uh, yes, with, with people like, for instance, Mark Yardley and Dom, yeah. Now the combination there is he's Dom is very much the the, the the service provider. He's 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 the he's the ready to order guy. He'll come with loads of different ingredients, and then between Mark, Mark is the chef. He'll amazing. Top tail. It's a great combination. It's You're a great right. combination. And there's, there's there are other examples like that. Heavy trackers, which which are a grime outfit. The heavy trackers are very much the same. It's a combination thing. It's a duo. It's the Chemical duo. Chemical Brothers, thing. Chemical Punk. Brothers, Daft Punk. There we go. Yeah, exactly. And there's something about there's something to be said about that dynamic sometimes when I see those kind of dynamics you're like how the fuck does that ever work like you are so different to him or you know yeah but somehow it just suddenly it works you've got dual heads going on here crafty you've got two things going on at once that some some duos just match match for match you've got both you have to do both of them which I, I think to a lot of people that are listening in on this is it's quite a it's quite that's, and then you go on tour as well, and then you, and you know what I mean, and then you've got to do the promo for this. You come around to the podcast, you know, it's all these different things, and it's, it's quite a lot to take on in a, in, a, in a. When I look back at my career, um, and I look about some of the things that I've achieved and some of the things that I've done, I just can't believe how quickly those things happened and came about. But like, I remember when I first started, it took so long to get those breaks. Mm. You know, Sonic Mook experiment in London. DJing in yeah. certain venues, DJing at a bar. Honey Club, Zap, all those places yeah. in Brighton. I mean, check this out. I, know, I DJed at a bar in Brighton when I first had my record shop every Friday for about a year, every single Friday before I met Lloyd School of Thought and set up Supercharge. And it had the most god-awful name ever called Skid Row. And it was the back of a back, <laughs> oh, back street in Brighton. And I was like, but, check this out, negative to positive. It's like... I. Th- I thought, you know what? I enjoy the fact that I'm DJing and I've been given an opportunity. And I literally got paid peanuts to do it for like four hours every Friday night from like 7 to 11. 
But it taught me to be a better DJ because people would walk in so early doors, I'd be playing like light, funky music. And then as the evening progressed, I'd be playing sort of more danceable stuff. And everyone was like, mm. by the end, by 11 o'clock, everyone was like, more, 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 more. Mm. So it taught me to become a better DJ. And then when I started doing Supercharged with Lloyd at Funky Buddha, again, you know, sometimes when we didn't book acts and I'd do the whole four hours from eight, no, from, from 10 till two, I would play warm up, middle, bangers at the end so i'd learn from like hip-hop uh uh the moax trip-hop stuff mm. to like breaks and then drum and bass and, and and mix all these things in to make me a better dj and with all these experiences and stuff like that it helped just develop me as a, as a as a better artist and it also helped within my production and if you look at all my albums there's little flavors combined in there and different vocalists, rappers, singers, and sure. stuff like that, and with good artwork, you know, Let's Ride, Freak Show, Tricker Technology, Adventures of a Reluctant Superhero, all really good artwork, all really good vocalists on there, all interesting music, and it was taking influences from little bits, but I didn't go fully down one path. I mean, I did touch on the electro house scene and combine that into my sound and a little bit of the dubstep and stuff like that, but I didn't go fully fledged and think, right... Fuck off all no, the but other this stuff. This was, was also at a time where, you know, the likes of the basement jacks were experimenting and doing yeah. things as well. Like this was, I, yeah. I, I remember that, I remember you touching on these times, but it was all for the time. It didn't feel like it was yeah. out of context. I, I didn't go off off the rails and suddenly make a whole album that was just dubstep or electro house. I just used some of those elements. Like when I done the Crafty Cuts re-rubs album, I loved some of the electro house stuff and some of the house music, but I ch turned it into turned it into breakbeat sort of flavours. And everyone's like, oh, I really like this because I like that house record, but I'm not really into house music, but I like it. Mm. But now I can play it in my set. Mm. Because it was like it had a break underneath it, or it, had, it would chopped around. So I was editing all these records, and it was just what I did. And, and uh, you know, some people didn't like it, and it can't please everyone. But it was something that I liked, and I got a little fan base from it, and it helped in developing where I yeah. am today. But do you and think become that, a better DJ? Do you think as well. that comes with seasonal? Do you think, as like you say, now you play a little bit more house? I think house music, uh, um, well, in retrospect to now has changed so much. Oh, God, yeah. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, it, it's, it's actually... It's, it is those influences like Basement Jacks. It is the Prodigy. It is all Chemical these... Chemical Brothers, Chemical yeah. Brothers, yeah, yeah. certainly. That the really forced... Forced a... A certain change within house yeah. music, and now where where we are now. I mean, don't get me wrong. There's still that good core element of like the disco sort of sound. With it, and we all love a good disco house record. Yeah, big up, but, big up, Scream and the likes that are doing their thing. You know, yeah, no, on, exactly. On it's good to see um, Ollie. You know, he's posting a lot of some of his new music that he's writing on on Twitter, and it's great. And yeah, yeah. he's such a, a a fun guy to be around, and a lot 100%. of that crew. Yeah. You know, but like, I was very lucky that. The energy that I put into my music and my DJing, kind of people got. Mm. You know, when they come watch a Crafty Cut show, you know, I'd have four decks set up or three decks. I was mixing records, I was scratching, I was dropping acapellas, I had dynamite to do all my mm -hmm. shout outs. Mm -hmm. So it was a show. Mm. It wasn't just mixing records, it was kind of everything. And I was jumping up and down like a crazy man behind the decks to try and create. That was the hardest thing to get that confidence to, to shine behind the decks. Mm. And, and, you know, I wasn't on the mic. But I was, I was, you know, lively behind the, the decks and I got a residency at Fabric and then I was playing all the big clubs around the, the UK and mm -hmm. the world and I was doing tours and getting, doing really big things in Australia. You know, I'd done the Big Day Out tour with Dynamite, which was just exceptional. Bonkers. I, I, did, I did one of those dates once. I mean, I know this was unheard of because you have to do all of them, but I, I do remember doing one. Oh, you done one? Yeah. yeah, they were they were the best shows of my life. Like I've never experienced anything. Australia like it. loves that breakbeat business. They did, yeah, and they still do. Yeah. And and that really helped me. And this is the thing that I don't understand. And and you guys you comment know, below. <laughs> yeah, comment below because this I, I I would find this fascinating. So I'd go to Australia, and really to me, Australia, Canada, and the UK all we're all in the Commonwealth. We're all very similar in terms of like you know what we hear. We kind of you know, carries on and, and becomes popular. Mm. So I'd go out to Australia and I'd perform to like 40,000 people, 20,000 people, and, and they absolutely loved it. But then in the UK, it was kind of like, 
they still liked it, but those opportunities weren't available to me. Mm. And I could never really figure that out. It's not that I felt that I deserved those opportunities and I should have those opportunities. But if I'm getting those opportunities in Australia and in Canada mm. and sometimes in America, why can't I get these opportunities constantly in the UK. Don't get me wrong, I did have some fantastic experiences at Glastonbury mm. and Clapham Common and Global Gatherings and, and the Glade Festival and Festival and stuff like that. But in England, we, we you know, pre-COVID... You had, to fight your, you had to fight your corner. You more. did, and there was... Oh, my God, we have got so many festivals in the UK. But it, it was quite strange that, like, you know, the breakbeat movement could have been even huger in the UK because it's something that we created... And you could have seen these DJs constantly. I think it's just timing, you know. A lot of the breakbeat artists kind of broke away from the scene and and went on to do other mm. things. And I think maybe that contributed in the same way as dubstep kind of like broke away and and found its fame in America. Let's yeah, say. Dub, yeah, I was going to say dubstep is is a great example actually of of talk about being shunned in the UK, like almost like oh it's that season now bye, and then next they're in America killing it. Can't get a fucking gig for love nor money in the UK. UK, it's fallen off, isn't it? And it's like yeah. the breakbeat scene kind of got dealt that card as well. Why I, Why do you? I mean, it's a really good question. What's your theory on that? Well, basically what happened was the Spanish scene came in and they liked it a lot faster and harder. And then a lot of people started making that sound. And then predominantly a lot of the bigger acts within the breakbeat scene, I'm not going to mention any names, they kind of didn't like that sound the new school breaks as it might have been uh, or the kind of like 140 sort of dubstepy mm. style break being noisy, Larry sort of stuff. <clears throat> and then people in the UK, it wasn't, it wasn't their thing. It was working well in Spain. So mm. people didn't really enjoy that sort of sound. So suddenly the people who are making breakbeat sound, I don't want to go with that style. And then they start discovering more house orientated music or deeper sort of tech house. Mm. And they kind of went into that. And a lot of the big and artists and names were lost over mm. the six month period. And those names were integral to making the breakbeat movement as what it was. And they because they were doing award ceremonies at Fabric with the, the Breaks Pole Yeah, awards. man. And, you know, there were some big names and big acts and it was, it was being played on Radio 1. Big up Derek Delage as well. Must have, you yeah. know, the big beat world and, you know. Derek Delage, oh my God, yeah, from FSUK. Yeah, he's only around a corner. Oh, is he really? Yeah, yeah. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. the likes of, like, luckily enough, we've still got, like, the Plump DJs and Stantons and Freestylers and Decline and myself. Yeah. But, you know, the, Freak Nasty and Adam Freeland yeah. and Meet Katie and you know all these names they're kind of lost yeah and they went ventured elsewhere and it never came back adam freeland so, was a duke oh, he was a don he had a um, he had his thing going on he did yeah he had uh when i had my record shop in brighton i had dave stone at the top who run botch and scarpa and movement the drum mm. and bass night and then in the middle floor i had marine parade which was adam that's freeland. right yeah and he had a girl working for him called uh gem who went on to make pop music and she'd done an album, kind of like that Lily Allen sort of sound. Really? And she'd become a huge success. And so we had Adam Freeland in the middle and then we had myself with my record store. Insane. And then downstairs we had the techno demons in the, th in the basement. Legacy shit, see? You see what I mean? And Ed Solo was upstairs. Hold tight, Ed Solo. Stone. And, uh, oh, my God, we used to have... I had so many great people come in my record store. Great record labels. The Cat Skills, they were... Cat Skills they was were amazing. Brighton. Johnny... They were Brighton, and then obviously Skin, and then you had uh, Mick Fuller, who he was doing yep, that. Skin, yeah, yeah. There were so many, so many good things yeah. happening around Rec. that time. Produced yeah, Rec, Rec one. He done some stuff on Skin. He he was great graffiti. Great, artist, he? fuck his up his crew. Hold tight. She and Rec. Yeah, that was it. Yeah, and there, there was a lot of creative people in Brighton. It was a hub for a lot of fantastic things that were mm. spreading itself across the UK and the world. Mm. And I was lucky to be in that period at that time. But do you think that, because just going back to what you were saying about Breakbeat and how it's the, the flavours of the, of it go in and out month by month. But don't, but I feel like, and I, I, I can only say this from my point of view, doing podcast, um, beatboxing, um, is uh, if you're in the mix, you're in the mix, isn't it? If you know these people, you know these people. It's like, I see these documentaries about punk music in New York and like, next thing, there's Chuck D 
talking about how influenced he was with punk music. And it was really? almost, well, yeah, because New York was a, it, it's a, it's a like creative a hub. hub, but yeah. Yeah, you're right, you're right. And the disco scene yeah. and the hip-hop scene, a lot of things born out of New York, wouldn't yeah. they? And it's the and same it's like here. Brighton. Yeah, Big same, exactly. And, and sort of like, I wouldn't say Breakbeat was predominantly born from... Trip-hop, I think tri- trip-hop yeah, played trip-hop a big part. Yeah, trip-hop definitely played a big part. And then obviously the Mowax and the skin stuff from, from, from there, definitely. And I remember I played a gig once in Brighton. It was one of the most... I was so, so in awe. Jazzy Jeff came to Brighton. It was his first time. And they asked me to do the warm-up. And, it was, it, uh, and I was like, oh, my God, I can't believe I'm about to warm up for the most incredible DJ on the planet. Yeah, question. And I was playing, like, trip-hop stuff and, and, you know, mixing it in with hip-hop. And, the, and I knew that Jeff would be playing all the classic hip-hop stuff. Yeah. So I thought, no, don't go on before... Because he wasn't like Grandmaster Flash where you'd get a list of all the records that you couldn't play. Jeff was never like that. He the was notorious such a cool list. So, yeah, the list. And I thought, but I'm not going to play like loads of like Gangstar, Pete Rock, Public Enemy, um, The Message, and just all the classic hip hop thing. I'm going to try and do something different here. So, trip hop was like kind of like this cool instrumental hip hop flavored sound. And I thought I'd play some of the more down tempo mm. sort of stuff before he went on. And he's. Um, tour manager and I, I i went for it as well i you know i brought my own mixer uh which he loved and used and he signed it and um <laughs> oh think, dear not a basic evening at all <laughs> yeah and um i played a really cool set and jeff was really appreciative he was like he he came in and he saw about a good half hour of it and he played a really good set he cut up dance to the drummer's beat what i'd been waiting for yeah. to hear for years <laughs> and his tour manager came up to me while jeff was playing and he put his arm around me and he said, dude, that's one of the best warm-up sets we've had, simply because you just... Darnell, didn't... was his name Darnell? Yeah, yeah. yeah big yeah. up Darnell, yeah. And he said to me, I really enjoyed it. And Jeff was really appreciative that you didn't touch on loads of stuff that he might have played. And it was such a, such a great feeling to know that I'd done something really special for one of my favourite DJs. And yeah. I thought, yes, sir, get in there. And the same thing happened with Cash Money when he won the World Mixing Finals in 1988. I was there at... Um, and watching him, and then when I won an award at Breaks Pole, he was there with his tour manager from Manchester. He used to mm. tour him, Jack, mm. Mm. and he and I'd met him a few times and just shook hands and you know friendly gestures. And then he come up to me, he put his arm around me, he goes, "You're crafty man. I'm proud of you for winning that award. Big up, fella." And I was like, "Oh my god, I can't believe it. Cash money has just come up to me oh, and picked me up for winning the award." So I've had some incredible moments that I just you know chase your dreams, people. Do yeah. your thing. And if you're good and you practice, good things will help. Facts. And always watch and learn from other people that might not be your chosen field, but you can gain some something from it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and there's a lot on YouTube and there's a lot of people that you can follow on Instagram and Twitch that you can pick up helpful t- tips from. Yeah. And, you know, I've done that um, over... You know, YouTube was a big thing and obviously going to shows and watching DJs. Mm. And I'm lucky, you know, touring as well has helped me being on platforms and, and stages where there's been people that I'd not heard of and come away and thinking, wow, that person's really good. Yeah. Well, in terms of upcoming, I mean, obviously your son, for starters, but in the breakbeat world, like who, who are you seeing at the moment where you're like, yeah, like they're killing it? There's a lot of these Spanish guys. There's Yo Speed, there's Gower and the 83 label and there's another label in America called Toast and Jam. And that whole kind of like bass scene has developed into like that old kind of like old school Miami bass sound again. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Oh, I love it. And it just makes you want to go like <gasps> yeah. that. And hey, hey, little... listen. He pulls out some <laughs> moves on his show, man. I've seen some moves on his Twitch. I'm like, yeah, you got the beat boys going again. So that whole kind of sound has helped push into the breakbeat scene. And a lot of the old cats like Crystal Method and DJ IC coming back through. But then obviously you've got like some of the new guys like Frankie Wah and Bonobo and Totally Extinct Dinosaur. Ooh. Oh, teed. Ooh. And all these guys are making really cool breakbeat sounds. So to me, I feel like the breakbeat sound has come back again in a slightly different way. Not so, a little bit slower, um, more slightly epic, more musical but just really nice. And I think that, um, yeah, it's having a bit of a resurgence at the moment. And, you know, I still make some breakbeat stuff, not as much as I'd like to, because it's quite difficult, really, mm. to quite make. I find making hip-hop is a little bit easier. I think that's because I just love sampling stuff and and kind of get inspired by funk and, and you know, whatever I hear mm. at the time. 
And that's why I'm writing um, a new hip hop album at the moment. And I've got some cool guests on there, like Fat Lip from Far Side. Yeah, but anyone says like Fat Lip, you know that. And I spoke to Craze about this. That bizarre ride to the Far Side, um, which I got at your store, by the way. Yeah, oh my god, bro! What? Like that was again yeah. album cover, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. The fun fair, like the, the best. Roller coaster. I can't believe I asked. I think I asked them about that. Come on, coloured vinyl as well, didn't yeah, it? That's Do you right. Double, yeah. That's Double right. was it yellow and a white that's vinyl, right, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. But yeah. like, yeah. Working with these people, were like and and lyrics born. I've done a couple of tracks with Charlie. Oh my God! You wait till you hear the track with um, Charlie and Dynamite called Worldwide Echo. It's like oh. nothing I've ever wrote, and it's like something I've always wanted to write. I spoke to Charlie and said to him, "Mate, this is something that I've always wanted to do," and he was like, "Bang into it and big up Dynamite because you smashed it on this." Mm. And I've done a couple of other tracks with Dynamite. Done a wicked track with Scarlet Quinn. What a voice she's got! Oh yeah, Scarlet, hold tight, Scarlet. Yeah, yes. she's got an amazing voice. She's I mean, got a great voice. She has, and I've done a really cool track with her. I've done lots of different types of music for this next album, and also during the course of writing this this next hip hop album, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go back in on the Adventures album, Adventures of Reluctant Superhero, and I'm going to remix the whole album. You remix the whole thing? I've re- I've done. I'm into twelve. Maybe 13 tracks, I've only got three more to do. So that's going to be re-released, called The Re-Adventures. And Jake is going to do some new artwork to go with that. And big up everyone who was involved in The Adventures album. You know, I can't thank you guys enough. And I'm really excited about that. So um, let me see, probably October, we'll have the, the, the album remixed. Probably come in coloured vinyl, new sleeve. And maybe, and a couple of new tracks in there as well. But the remixes are really cool. All hip hop remixes. One of them is just probably one of the best things I've ever done with Alex right. Chambers. It's called Entro, which is the first track. Wait till you guys hear it. It's like spaghetti western on acid. Jesus Christ! <laughs> with with a hip hop flavour. It is a mental tune. It just builds. Go crazy. I played it on my stream, and the reaction was phenomenal. So, keeping myself busy, like writing music, is 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 is. Do you is ever my get vice. down? Do you ever? There isn't. You and you've always been like this. It's the energy, the enthusiasm. I, I feel like don't it ever wear. Don't don't you ever ever have a moment where you're like, yeah, I have done recently. I've like had a few lapses where I've just like you know not felt depressed and stuff like that, but just felt a little bit down, a little bit negative, a little bit exhausted. Just like all my um, creative juices have been zapped from me. Kind of like it's really weird, like that whole superhero thing because there's a lot of new series on TV mm. of superheroes. There's mm. one called. Uh, Jupiter's Legacy or something. I think okay. I started watching it. And and it's like sometimes, you know, I'm not saying I'm a superhero, but like, you know, you have all these things that you've acquired and done and achieved mm. and you kind of think, oh, I, I just feel like, although the year I haven't done as much as I'd like to, I actually have. Like doing a stream every mm. week, putting a whole new DJ set together each week, and researching and finding new music that you haven't played, plus learning to talk and communicate on the microphone, which has never been mm-hmm. my forte, is a new experience for me. And getting the setup right, it's quite nerve wracking making sure that everything rolls mm-hmm. and you've got all these people waiting and wanting to see you do something and 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 of a high level. I just add value to that as well while we're on this subject because I think that does take a lot of stress to do. And and you know, you don't always Okay, you'll get told when something's shit, but you actually won't get told when something's great. Mm. If you've managed to achieve uh, with as less stress as possible, the best you can possibly provide, and people don't say anything, it normally means it's okay. You never, it's a kind of thankless task when, when you're doing these things, and you, you, people don't know how much it takes in the back end to try no, and figure it no, out. No, exactly <laughs> right there. But the, and that's what exhausted me for like a year doing these streams while also looking after my two young children, Rosie and Tommy, who are 6 and 11, and also trying to find money because, mm. you know, mm. my career was just stopped mm. dead. So I'd be earning good money and, and I never saved my money. I wasn't very good at, like, protecting my money. So I'd just spend it on my kids, on my family, on my friends, having a good time, mm. having a nice house mm. and stuff like that. And then suddenly, like, oh shit! What am I going to do? I never. I should have saved. I should have put this away because I just didn't expect it. So I had to make ends meet. And a big thanks to everyone who donated on coffee and stuff to keep me going. And the streams were like a really good way of me exerting myself with all my knowledge of music 
and there's some really good things still to come. I'm going to be doing some different streams. So I've stopped doing my streams for a few few weeks to go back, reevaluate, and make it better. I've built a studio in my garage um, with a little bit of money that I do have. And um, I'm going to make my streams better. I'm going to do some more like podcasty type streams where I play music that inspired me. Ooh, fucking great. And then talk about those tracks to people and say, why did Hashim Alna Fish the Soul, why did it help me conjure up these tracks that I did? And Jurassic 5, you know, Concrete Schoolyard. Mm. I used that on my first ever mix that I'd done called Slam the Brakes on. And then I ended up working with Jurassic 5. and, and Self-fulfilling how, prophecies. Yeah, 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 exactly. And thinking about things that I never dreamed of that can happen, and they can happen to each and every one of us if you put your mind to it. You know, if you want to be a really good yoga instructor, you watch all the videos, you get really good at it, you practice. Next minute, you know, you might be doing it and then you might go to a, a place in Thailand and you might be teaching with some of the best people <laughs> in the world or whatever it might be, you know, like, camera work and stuff like that you know you might think oh i'd love to be involved in movies and stuff and you might go on a course that teaches you how to use a camera and then suddenly your knowledge and wisdom and knowing about that camera and how good you can take photos and video stuff next minute you know you do something someone sees like i really like that Mm. and and then you might be working on a film set as as like you know just back bit herping someone mm. and the next minute you know in a couple of years time you're suiting the next bloody superman movie or batman movie or yeah, something a thousand per- and your testament to this again crafty cuts you 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 make something out of nothing a, neg- a positive in, out of a negative it's and i think that is the only way to process those journeys you know okay we've all suffered immensely one way or another with with what happened with setbacks, lockdown yeah. Yeah, and setbacks yeah setbacks and life happens and stuff but um if you can come out the other side with more value than what you left with then that's that's fucking the mission complete isn't yeah. it Uh, It's like what you're doing with your podcast. You've had, you know, if you look back and you put all those names together on one sheet, you'd be like gobsmacked. You think, oh my God, I can't believe this. And like, if you said 15 years ago, I'd be speaking with all these people, you'd say, if I said that to you, you'd say, no, you're having a laugh. You know, Goldie and Doc Scott and Stanton Warriors, whoever it may be. The list is, you know, there's some brilliant people on that list. And like we were talking about the corrupt guys, you know, how long you'd wanted to get them on your show. And, you know, they're interesting people. They, they've, they've, they've done something that's created something amazing for people. And, you know, each and every one of the people that you've had on have done something and contributed something special to the music business in this country. And this country is a very special place for that. Mm. You know, whether some of these artists are living like... Goldie lives in Thailand and like Chris Lorenzo is one of the biggest sort of house, bass house producers. He lives in Los Angeles and yeah. like Jack Beats, you know, he yeah. lived in... Um, Down the road, uh, yeah, in, yeah, he, yeah, and he lived yeah. in Los Angeles for a while, yeah, didn't he? right, yeah. And a lot of people, you know, but they're still, if they're talented, will still ha- be doing something, even if you're not aware of exactly what they're doing. Mm. They're still involved in one shape or form part of this industry i told you from the jump when first i said dude i was so surprised that you weren't in my first 50 because you and me go back so far and the conversations i think will, will always remain timeless it's a uh, it's fucking great to have you on man oh thanks man you i know. really appreciate it's that. it's been good it has been really good it's been it's been emotional been like thinking about some incredible memories that i've had and those moments when you come into my shop, that tiny little shop, <laughs> that I, I worked so hard to keep my head above water. Mm. And it was it was funny because when I finished my both my record shops, I had one in Worthing and one in Brighton, and I was going backwards and forwards and my ex-wife would be in one. And then I had Mex working in the Brighton one and a few mm. other people. And I lost so much money from having a record shop. It's just, I'm not very good with money, unfortunately. But... When I finished in that record shop, I had like 25 grand's worth of debt, the the VAT people money. But I thought, I'm not going to go bankrupt. I'm going to pay that off and I'm going to fight to keep my head above water and rebuild my life because I split up with my wife and I was living in a shithole in Brighton and I had 25 grand's worth of debt. I had a really shitty car. I had nothing going for me in that respect. But the Crafty Cut stuff was just being born. Mm. And I was just starting to write some really good music. Out of the ashes. Yeah. 
And I took that all that negative and built a positive and the Crafty Cuts thing, you know, good things started to appear, mm. supercharged, mm. and then starting tours in Australia and then suddenly gigs in America music and sync Canada. And, things like that, yeah. and yeah, I got a sync for a music thing. Unbelievable. You're not going to believe this, guys. I'd done a track of Ed Solo that was in my shop, HVR, um, and I even used TC Islam on it as well. He'll type sound. We got the groove. We got the sound. We got the vibe to make you get down. I'll type TC Islam. Woo! It was used on the Coca-Cola commercial, which we got really well paid for. Yeah. And then they used it for one year when ITV done Match of, uh, match of the Day stopped and ITV came in and done a year of the football uh, premiership. It might have been the Football League at the time. No, it was the premiership. And they'd done the premiership for a year and they used ill-type sound as the... Your head must have gone off on this football tip. You must have been like, no way. I was like, I can believe it. My, every time football came on an ITV, bam, bam, we got the groove, we got the sound. It was, it was ill-type sound. And then we signed that to Finger Licking Records and that was my... Um, you know, time and finger licking and all that lot. And the finger licking was in Camden and that was like, a, again, a hub mm -hmm. for all the breakbeat producers. And there's a great photo online that you can see and there's all the breakbeat producers all together, all on one in one picture. And it's like there's about 20 of us. And it brings back great memories from a lot of the good times. Mate, these are seminal moments in, in your career. But, like, you know, just the, the, from ashes come to... Life is about many lives, isn't it? And and funnily enough, what, what I guess what the narrative of the whole conversation is, if you if you experience this and you experience that, you, you it does formulate into something. It morphs into something else. Like if you hadn't have been the record store, and if you hadn't been the the the, the budding DJ, if you hadn't you know done your fingers in, and you you know all of these. Factors. I wouldn't be sat here talking to you now. That's what I'm saying. I wouldn't have done all these travels. I wouldn't have met all these people, and I probably wouldn't have. It is a really interesting fact of that so i was going to dubai a lot and djing and this was it before i'd done the djing in dubai with a skills actually i was playing these really big festivals called sand dance or something funny enough that's a strange <laughs> name and um and then i started no it's actually before those and i remember going to a club and it was so hot like it was like 30 degrees 40 degrees at night that dubai and coming out know. and and you'd open the door so you'd been in a, in a air-conditioned and then you'd open the door and it's like an oven and like hitting you. So I went out there to DJ, just a normal thing in, you know, in Dubai, uh, playing a set. And I met this girl there called Kate. And um, if I hadn't met her that night, I wouldn't have my children because she then moved back to England. And we, um, we got together and then we had two children, Rosie and Tommy. So if I hadn't gone to Dubai and played that gig, I'd never have met her and I wouldn't have two beautiful children along with my twins, Billy and Harry. Yeah. So life throws things at you that you'd never expect. You know, and we, you could talk about some of the people that you've met through your travels and how they've altered your life in certain ways or brought joy or pain, whatever it might but be. So, but, but, bro, like, and again, we're just going back to the first times I experienced hip-hop was in your shop. Yeah. Right. Sometimes you put yourself in those places, and you something. It's a it's a conduit. You're just you're just going along with it, because I don't think I don't think you ever thought twice about music being in your life. No. But to be given that opportunity to run with a particular ball and say, actually, you know what? I kind of know that guy. I know that. Guy. I'm, I'm going to run with this. Some people don't have that instinct in them, and that's just that is that's what's special. So you may know everybody, you may have a phone book to die for, but if you ain't got no reason to be calling people, you know. That's so a really good point. Yeah, and I think, you know, your path when you used to come into my shop was set because I was like, wow, this guy's an interesting guy. You know, he could do this beatbox <laughs> crazy style. And I was just like, you know, blown away. And I think a lot of people were. And then suddenly, you know, you started showcasing your talents and now you're doing your podcasts because mm. you just of your knowledge of meeting people yeah. and seeing people's journeys. As you go, yeah. And it's like we all choose what we feel is, is a really good path for us. Beatboxing is one of those difficult things because it's one of those things that people love, but it's not something that you could constantly keep doing yeah. day in, day out, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. So you need to find another thing as well. Yeah. Whereas DJing is just one of those things where, you know, it's, it's just accepted. It's a soundtrack for people's full stop, whatever yeah. they're doing in an yeah. evening. They don't have to necessarily know the music or the DJ, but it's a soundtrack as much exactly. as a, it's the environment, isn't it? 
Yeah, and, you know, we do choose our paths. And if you choose it correctly and you put a lot of time, effort and work into it, hence why you're, you know, what you're doing now and what I'm doing now, you get really good at it. Yeah, you get quick at it, don't you? Yeah, you get, and it, it, it's, it's like second nature. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes as you get older, you get better. Yeah, not worse. Right. Yeah, it's not like a footballer or you know a racing driver. As they slowly get older, obviously you know their reactions become not quite as quick as what they were. Mm. You know, and like I played football last night, and my legs are absolutely killing me. And I wish I didn't feel like that. I love that you still play football. I love. <laughs> like, I, love I remember football. going into the store, and I don't know who you're with. I think they're all just music guys as well. But I used to, I used to be so purist about like hip hop and stuff, and I'd just hear you guys talking about football, and I'm like, this isn't hip hop, you know? It's <laughs> but you guys used to love football, dude. Yeah. I remember you guys used to talk about. It. I don't know who was in there. Mex was in there. I think he. Yeah, was Mex in. didn't like football. Yeah, there's a lot of DJs who don't like football, but there's a lot of other musicians and artists who bloody do yeah. like football. You know, there's quite it's a funny. few few of them are big Liverpool fans. But it's a release for a lot of things. You know, it's not all one-dimensional, isn't it? And um, and I think that's what the world is now. The last thing the world is in music is one-dimensional. It's, it's, you know. That's a good point. You know, if you think about, like, a career now, it's not, it's, it's not one-dimensional. Years ago, it would be, you know, in terms of, like, you know, practising your skill and your art. Now, you've got to learn about uh, social media. That is what, one of the biggest parts, and we were talking about this Huge. earlier. Yeah. And I remember years ago when I first started doing social media, I was posting a lot of stuff on my on my page that I, was probably nothing really to do with Crafty Cuts. But it was fun, I really enjoyed it, and it was a good way of, you know, escapism. But I thought I need to put a stop to this. I need people to see me for what I really am. And they were fun things to watch. I mean, mm. people know that side of me, that I'm a quirky, funny sort of guy. But I wanted people to appreciate my music, my DJing and other things in life that I felt that I was really good at. And that wasn't being portrayed within the stuff that I was promoting. And you learn this within social yeah. media. And then when I start to push like my music and my shows and my, 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 my skill traits... People were appreciating it more rather than, say, a video of, of, a, of a cat singing or a dog dancing or mm. someone jumping at an extremely incredible height or something. You know, they're fantastic, don't get me wrong, and it is fun to watch, but not from Crafty Cuts. Mm. You know, people want to see, you know, things related to me or something that's about me. And I feel like it's really important now for me to kind of go on that path and do that for me personally. Mm -hmm. And poor, don't get me wrong, I still post up some some funny little clips and little pieces that have humoured me at the time, but not in the same way as mm -hmm. I used to. And I feel like, I, I'm, I feel really pleased about that now because I'm, I, my, my music... And my, my clips of me DJing are getting so much more interaction. And it's funny how much we really rely on social media. It's like we were talking earlier. If you put True. a video up, up or one of your podcasts and it got hardly any views, it would be disappointing for you. Mm -hmm. Because you're like, what have I done wrong? Why is it like this? And it is important for us to get likes or or support on what we're doing because it just keeps building and building and growing and growing. Mm. And if we didn't get that, mm. or if we didn't, a lot of people don't want to share people's stuff. I'm the opposite. Mm. I'm not like, if, if someone's done something, I will share that and push it. Why not? Yes, Why don't we all help it, together? What people doesn't realise, but people, some people don't realise is that, that that like may not, you may not appreciate in, in, in total the thing that you're liking, but it pushes an algorithm to a newer eyes set of yeah. ears that may like it. And, it, mm. and that's the... That's 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 really the the objective, isn't it? To anything that you want to post is like, okay, well, hopefully I've got a hardcore fan group that would that would honour the fact that, that that I'm supporting, I'm supportive of this, or I love this, and let it let it fly, let it let them be the be the vehicles to take it to the next set of eyes and ears. You know, they're that's sharing. a bloody good point. The vehicle to, to to new people is really important. You know, for example, you do a podcast and like I think you had Doc Scott on the other week and if I reposted it or shared it to my fans, mm. they might go, oh, I didn't realise Doc Scott done 31 seconds mm. or, or run 31 records, sorry, mm. and all these things that he used to, to do and same with Groove Rider and Vadim or whoever mm. you might have had on your show, Stanton Warriors, they might have not realised that they remixed Basement Jacks or yeah, Macy yeah, yeah. Gray or whatever. And like, oh, I, I forgot that they'd done that. Or Doom's Night, whatever. Because the legacy is so deep. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and the same with the freestylers and, and whoever. You know, 
it's really important that we as 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 artists and musicians that we share each other's um products and achievements and things that we do obviously if you're into it and you enjoy it mm. but it really helps out as an artist yeah. you know instead of being like oh i don't want to share that i'm all about myself I'm never understood like, it never understood it's it. really important that we all work as a team and 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 as as and help each other out yeah. to push these things further yeah. so that they grow and become bigger especially which when leads on to other especially things. when they're not in your genre when you see something that is like super like out there and may not be your taste in music but you like that yeah exactly. and you're like well actually my audience might like that and it's, it's giving it's it's enhancing people's understanding or discovering of new things you've got to, you have to you, that's just part of the music that's part of the music conversation isn't it uh, yeah sorry to to drag this on but there's a really an interesting theory here yeah, yeah go for it so People obviously know that there's a link with Fatboy Slim with me, but you wouldn't think that he would be my him and him and Jazzy Jeff are the two most important people within my development of my career. I tell you why, Jazzy Jeff, from the perspective of his scratching and his scra his ability as a turntable DJ, but Norman Cook for his ability to react with a crowd and to play a record at the right time and just his his incredible attitude behind the turntables and him being also such a very nice person really helped me grow, grow, grow confidence as a DJ behind the decks mm -hmm. and showing that I'm not a shy DJ and just like not, not you know, being a bit within myself because we were all like that at one stage um, in terms of like, oh, this is a bit nerve-wracking in playing in front of all these people and you could be really shy and not and just do your thing, but when you're confident and you you stand tall, oh my god, mm. people are like, oh my god, this guy's really good. And it gives them smiling. confidence. It gives them confidence to and like they what breathe on yeah. your energy, and that's what Norman did. And and Jazzy Jeff was just so good. So you combine those two elements together, and it really helped me. And then seeing other DJs like mix records, like Roger Sanchez and Youssef, watching them DJ and mix records seamlessly, like mm. I've never seen mm. before. I was like, oh my god! And, and I was like, how did they do that? So I practiced and learned to blend and mix records as well as scratching, and then as well as being confident behind the decks, all these different DJs and cash money as well. Mm. I learned to become so much of a better DJ and so grateful to mm. to norman and to jeff and and even like scratch bastard now watching him it's like oh my god he's just so good mm. i need to up my game i need to be better mm -mm. and watching these people do that and a skills as well he's a he's a really good dj you got to watch his streams mm. on thursday night fantastic absolutely brilliant and scratch bastard does his coffee morning thing mm. and there's the other guys like the next men oh my god those guys are Whoa. so good yeah oh, big up next Brad and yeah, yeah all day next men and and eva lazarus as well though she's mm. got a new track out with them guys and gentlemen's dub club and mungo's hi-fi and all these guys are making such good music and big up to the uk scene mm. and you know we have got so many talented artists that i just am loving that are coming through yeah. at the moment hey listen if you don't know get to know all these people that, you know what i mean we we're gonna pick them up later but these names you we're dropping them for a reason make sure make sure you check out all of these artists uh, Crafty man, I mean, holding it down like you literally are. He, not only does he show you the selections and the new music, he tells you about the artists that are out there as well. I'm, I'm actually feeling like my best is to come in terms of my music. I've still got great. My DJing's got better through doing the streams. Mm -hmm. I've got, I think, I've got a better selector, and my engagement with the crowd is is really strong in terms of like. You know, when I talk to people, I'm seeing them and hearing what they like and what they, you know, what they love. So that's made me become a better selector. Mm. And then also, you know, a better producer by playing all different forms of music, thinking, you know what, that'd be a good idea if I'd done this. And then suddenly, mm. you know, next week I'm working in the studio. Big up Alex Chambers, who I work with. Um, Old Alex. He's, he's amazing. He's like... You know, I love working with this guy and without him, you know, Crafty Cuts wouldn't be anything that I am at the moment. But I've worked with some amazing um, producers and engineers like Ed Solo, yeah. Chris Sargent yeah. Yeah. and A-Skills. You know, these guys are phenomenal at what they do. And I think that most producers and DJs, when they do get to work with such great engineers and, and producers... You know, we we are blessed. You know, like this, we were talking about Dom with mm. Mark Yardley and Lee Rouse and Andy mm. Gardner are just fantastic. And Matt and Aston mm -mm. together, this and the Chemical Brothers, 
and Daft Punk and all mm. these people, mm. you know, greatness does come in twos and, and, and obviously in singles as well. But um, I wouldn't be where I am with the help of others as well, yeah, you know. For real. I feel you. I feel you. And once you've got that formula, once you've got the right balance of chemistry and the thing, it's just hard to find, you know. Producers have this way of... Um, they work very sympathetically to the artists that they're, um, you know, that they're, they're, they're partnering with. I really value that in a, in a good producer. That it's, it's, it's selfless. It's, it's oh, egoless. Nice. Yeah. It, you know? yeah, you're right there. And I love, this is my most enjoyable thing, is seeing new artists rise and become really good at what they do because it's so enjoyable to see that person really good at what they do mm. and getting the recognition of what they do. I can vouch for this. It's 100% true. He's always, always been super supportive of me, for real. Not one time. I remember calling up the shop when when I was coming up and you were like, oh, you come to the shop. Come to the shop if you're, you're passing through after the gig. You know, you, you were always that guy. Oh, thanks, mate. Mm. Yeah. I, 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 I've lived and breathed music since I lost my fingers and had my record shop and started writing music and DJing and traveling the world. And my fans are just as important as I am, you know. They're, they're, they're imperative to what makes me what I am. Mm. And, um, and all the people that come to the shows and support, people that watch the streams and people that look at podcasts and stuff like that, you know, if you didn't support all these things, then obviously, you know, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing and the same as Lee as well, you know. Yeah. Well... On that note, big up the crafty cuts inside the place. Thank you so much for passing through. Lee, thanks for having me, yeah, man. man. It's, been, it's been emotional. <laughs> it has, it's been a ride. It? Told you it would be. <laughs> if you don't know about Crafty Cuts, get to know. You follow him. He's got his Twitch stream that's popping. He's got the new albums that are coming. He's got the shows that are about to be storming across different countries and universes, whether the UK likes it or not. <laughs> we are like him as our fashion people, Killer Killer podcast. Don't talk to anyone. I wouldn't. Stay lucky, people. Peace. <laughs>